Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I just want to say I had a talk with Joel Langell in the warm-up room. We both shared a common uh, problem that we have, which is we talk too much during the title slide, and it leaves hardly any time for the stuff we're supposed to talk about. I just want to assure you that's not going to happen today because I'm aware that that's a problem, so I can control for it. Uh, second thing I'd like to mention is uh, give uh, thanks to Dale Peterson. It's an honor to be able to speak to you guys and to be here this week. Um, love, this, love this conference completely. I had a conversation this morning while walking here with my colleague, my colleague Meg Duba from INL, and we were talking uh, psychology issues. And so I want to do something with you before we actually turn off of the first slide. It's uh, called priming. So I'm going to say some words to you. I just want you to involuntarily load them into main memory so that when we actually get to a topic that's related to those, you'll have a more uh, complete experience of it. It'll be a better form of communication. Some of these words are money, profitability, critical infrastructure, national security. I may forget one or two, uh, but I'll, I'll come back at you uh, with them later on. You should also know this isn't going to be a super technical conversation. Uh, you just experienced Jason Larson in full. I don't have references to Bernie thingies uh, or anything as esoteric as that. So you can just relax and take it easy. We're still looking at the uh, first slide. And I, I'm, I'm aware of that. Last thing I want to say, and the first slide helps remind me of this, is that I'm sort of going to take a rhetorical position. Uh, this is a thought experiment, OK, to the extent you're familiar with that term. That means I don't necessarily completely believe uh, everything I'm trying to convince you of or, or move you towards. I'm sort of moving myself this direction at the same time. I'm suggesting this might be a good way for us to move people who are involved in risk management decisions, uh, people who inform uh, more senior people involved in making the call on risk manage management decisions. But let's see if you buy what I've laid out for you here uh, as we go through this, this deck. Here we go. All right, so you don't want to look at this slide too long. This is stuff that's available. There'll be too many slides since it'll be there for the, uh, the take home when you get a copy of the slides if you care to look at them. But I would like to point out that there are two papers here that inform this presentation, which, by the way, is not about CCE. Jason uh, either lied or he had bad information, the, the, introdu the introducing Jason. Jason. Um, the second one from the right, the case for simplicity in energy infrastructure, that was co-written with Mike Asante and Tim Roxy. Depending on how new you are in this space, uh, if you have any time in it, you'll, you'll know probably both of those names. Mike uh, was a longtime INL alum, uh, one of the giants uh, that we've had the pleasure to work with, and he passed way too early uh, this past July at age 40, 48. Uh, Tim Roxy is uh, of Constellation Energy and NERC fame. And uh, we wrote this piece uh, based on looking at the complexity, some of which Ralph talked about in his talk. Did a similar paper with Mike Asante after that about the hopeless amount of complexity in megacities in the near future where you can imagine 5G and IoT being everywhere. And how the heck are you going to manage that level of complexity? I think, as Ralph said, how can you, how, I'll, I'll botch it a little bit, but how can you even begin to secure something you don't even know you have, asset inventory, and so complex you don't even begin to understand it? Uh, some of those issues are laid out in that paper. Finally, on this screen, a paper that came out last year with uh, Harvard Business Review called The End of Cybersecurity. Their title might not, not mine, you don't always get to choose your titles. Uh, but basically, their point is this, this is an introduction to the consequence driven cyber informed engineering methodology, CCE, the lab uh, developed, which this talk is not about. This talk is not about this. So, but, but it does draw from, it does draw from a part of it. It's in uh, multiple phases. And the first part has to do with consequence prioritization. All, all CCE really cares about in the beginning is what are the worst things that could possibly happen to your company? Let's assume it's an industrial company, a critical infrastructure company. How would you kill your company? What would you aim for? And what would you have to do? And where would you have to be in order to create those effects? So that's part of the foundation from which uh, this talk, which I'm clearly about to get to, 
uh, is, is based on. There's also a plug here for a book, a book length piece, uh, which is going to go into much more detail on CC, uh, which we just pretty much finished writing, working with the editor, should be out before this year's over, hopefully by fall, if some of my other colleagues do their job in the next coming days. Objective, I'm, I'm telling you what I'm trying to do in this slide. I want you to consider, and if you've considered it, to reconsider uh, when you're talking about the classic risk management equation, risk equals probability or likelihood times impact or consequence uh, about clearing out the uh, probability and likelihood part. Because in certain cases, especially involving critical infrastructure, uh, as you will see, it's not really that helpful to spend much time doing that. And so the second part, it doesn't, it, if you find that you can't really do it to your own satisfaction, maybe don't bother doing it at all. Before I flip, I'll say, so much depends on your vantage point. I think I'm going to talk to you guys like your asset owners, like your electric utilities, oil and natural gas people, transportation, water sector, uh, even though uh, you're not necessarily. And uh, you can imagine how this conversation might be different if you're figuring out risk and likelihood from an insurance point of view, if you're a, a government regulator type person. Uh, it's a different conversation, but it certainly is related. Okay, Acceptable risk. We all live with uh, risk every day. It seems like something that we don't want, certainly in our business lives, we try to keep it to uh, absolute minimum, especially when we're talking about dangerous processes and, and functions in industrial settings. But risk really is important in a lot of ways. We can't really be alive without it. A uh, recent short story by the novelist or uh, fiction writer Edgar Caret posits these two angels up in heaven and they find themselves really longing for their past lives. In heaven, in his version, there is no risk at all. There's complete safety, uh, 100%. And both of them are longing for things like asking a woman or asking a guy out for a date and being rejected or going to Las Vegas and putting some money down or taking a risk and have that feeling of being alive. So. Uh, well, I'm trying to say we're talking about risk uh, and what's acceptable. Um, it is something we have to live with. We're just trying to calibrate it, and calibrating it is really part of this conversation. Now, check out this guy. Some of you have seen Dr. Strangelove. This is General Turgeson, and uh, he's advising the president that when we uh, accidentally lock in a, uh, launch a nuclear strike against Russia, it's an accident. Um, uh, is, is that a risk for us? And uh, he, George C. Scott is extremely confident and optimistic about this. He says, uh, yeah, yeah, we probably wouldn't lose more than 10 to 20 million killed. He said, we, the other way he said it for shorthand is we might get our hair must. So some people have higher tolerance for risk and or consequences others. I'm not a CIO. I haven't been a CISO. I've certainly been around them. I'm sure you have too. And if someone asked me to build a risk management program for cyber risk, there's a bunch of different places to turn. Two of the ones that I found uh, the fastest and was somewhat aware, familiar with are a place called the FAIR Institute and NIST. We keep referencing NIST as sort of the uh, Rosetta Stone, the thing we keep coming back to. It's sort of our common, our common language, lingua franca. The FAIR, both of them, as you can see highlighted here, talk about an acceptable level of risk or loss, uh, reducing risk to an acceptable level. Uh, I'm asking, what is that? How do, you, how do you know what that is? If you're a board member, if you're a CEO, CFO, chief risk officer, or in the, the senior cybersecurity positions, how do you know what's okay in terms of risk? Who makes those decisions and what types of tools do they use to feel some level of confidence in that? In the box of five different types from FAIR, uh, you can see them. Probably the number one that I'm going to be talking about the most has to do with rep replacement loss. If someone was able to take out substantial parts of extremely important, extremely expensive, long lead time to replace equipment, what would be the cost? What would be the cost of that loss? And would it cost you your entire company, for example? And what would be the downstream effects of that as well? So we saw General Turgeson going around the corner from the upper left-hand corner. Some of this is informed by personality types and experiences. So in the upper left-hand corner, I, I don't know for sure, but it sure looks like a picture I see every year from Yellowstone, which is pretty close to INL. This is a person I would have to call risk blind. They're not necessarily taking a risk as far as they're concerned. And yet, uh, they, sort of, they sure are. Um, in the upper right-hand corner, we have a classic daredevil person. 
I almost like the daredevil person better because while they are taking extreme risks, they, they're aware of it, they've prepared for it, and they've done everything they can to make sure that they get to do that at the show later that afternoon or tomorrow. In the lower right-hand corner, the young man, his bear, uh, I think of this as a good conservative example. This person may become a good auditor in the future, a uh, good controller of things. I mean, the bear's in tight. And uh, lastly, the, uh, uh, the lower left-hand corner, I think of this as an example. You're familiar with Frogger, perhaps. This is uh, other people's risk. I can, I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly willing to walk that frog into traffic over and over again. It's not me. It's getting squished each time. So you got all these things. These are factors to consider when you're talking about these things, the, the human aspect of these, these considerations. I went to a dictionary and pulled up uh, this phrase coming out of uh, an industrial context, and it elevates it up above just the companies or the military organization's context into uh, what civilization itself has to, has to be concerned about. And I note that right in the exact middle of that slide, I didn't bold it, but it seems a lot like the word acceptable to me is tolerable. What can we tolerate? Sounds a little bit worse than acceptable. Acceptable sounds like we decided in advance, and this is more like, mm, we could still survive, but it might be really painful. By the way, I forgot to make the remark that uh, the, the prep folks uh, said to me before I came on stage, which is, if you have uh, questions, please feel free to ask them at any time. I don't care if you ask them now or if you ask them at the end, if there's any time, if I ever stop talking. So questions are, are welcome. I have a lot of questions about this presentation. <laughs> All right, again, keeping you in the industrial mindset, uh, here are some decisions. And again, don't forget you were uh, primed with the words profitability and, and money and money-based decisions. Here's some, some questions you might face. Uh, should, it, should you shut down a piece of equipment for maintenance? Uh, or is it okay, do you think, for another week? And what, what data informs that decision? Could be an uh, important decision, as you can see. An operator, do they need additional training or do you think they're okay as they are? Do you think we need to put an additional safety shower in a hazardous area? Or is it probably enough people can reach the ones or the ones that are already there? And then finally, we've made a, a pretty significant change in a system or we've added a new piece or removed a piece, maybe a Bernie thingy or two. Sorry, I, I am using Jason's term. Um, do we need to do a HAZOP? Because now the tables have changed quite a bit. Or we still feel pretty comfortable with the results of the last one, even though it was on something completely different or largely different. All of those things, as it said at the bottom, uh, take it uh, as a, a matter of fact that somebody has figured out what acceptable risk is and has asked you to move forward on it. So here we are again to some more types, risk tolerance and acceptable loss. And even though I primed you on money and primed you on profitability, I'm going to say that there's a couple, piece, a couple images on this slide where while money is important, uh, if you're at the national security level, um, if you're at the strategic survival level of a company, money is always going to be a factor, but it may start to slide down a little bit list in terms of prioritization when raw survival or national security is at stake. It depends on your perspective what you're, where you're working from. Okay, so I'm going to slip, slip into me measurement a little bit, determining and managing risk. And here's, I think, where we're going to take the most direct charge at, uh, at likelihood and probability. Please travel with me uh, back to the year circa 1989. PCs, uh, if you were alive. If you weren't, there's books. You can read about these things. Um, or videos, if you don't read. Uh, the first PCs were starting to get out. The first Macs were, were there. They hadn't yet fully, obviously, infiltrated corporate America. Uh, Windows 95 was peeking around the corner, but I think we were largely in DOS land there. They certainly hadn't fully taken over. In, they weren't necessarily the operating system of your HMI yet, but uh, that was a glimmer in people's eye. When it was time to figure out what a company should do for this new word, William Gibson-esque word, cyber, uh, we didn't need to prioritize it too much back then because it was just a nuisance level risk. And so the probability of it happening at first, of anything happening that mattered was, was low, and the impact from something happening, if it did happen, seemed like it was going to probably be low as well. So we didn't prioritize too much at the time. Also, before I leave 1999, I'll say that was the beginning of my uh, cyber experience, cybersecurity experience. I was uh, a brand new lieutenant in the Air Force. I was at Hanscom Air Force Base in Concord, Massachusetts. 
and we were doing uh, acquisition of mainframes for the military. I think the competitors were IBM, a uh, company that made IBM uh, replicas called Amdahl, and maybe Fu Fujitsu. And the proposals came in uh, on multiple 18-wheel trailers, because it was all paper. S seriously, dozens of 18-wheel trailers and huge teams to pull those binders apart and see which thing was the best, the best proposal. It's really hard to imagine that now. Um, but cyber relevant was that we were using a book, uh, a guide called the Orange Book from the NSA, and they had developed uh, different ratings of what a secure mainframe would be and how administrators would work and how data would be compartmentalized and classified, et cetera. And so that was part of our, even in 1989, when you're talking about the DOD, uh, cybersecurity was on, was on their minds bef well before it hit real mainstream. Last point on this one is this is the same year that Clifford Stahl uh, wrote about his experience at a uh, academic slash national lab uh, on the very, very beginnings of the internet and uh, a cyber attack that he documented once he figured out what was going on. Many of you have read The Cuckoo's Egg, and those of you who haven't should probably read it because it's like, it's the ur document in our world. Um, now people, most people have probably read that book after the fact once they figured it out. Probably in 1989 when it came out, it uh, drew a bunch of yawns because of the low probability and low impact of our, of our field at the time. So back to the equation, risk equals probability times impact. And can we determine these things with any accuracy, with any precision, and with any confidence? There's a flavor of this equation that shows that we have some agency in uh, reducing or increasing risk, and it's the second equation. If we take the probability of something happen, but we throw some money at it, we might be able to reduce the probability, and therefore uh, there's, a less, there's less chance that we'll have the impact that we're trying to avoid too. And again, you're seeing the chart, it'll come back again. Uh, what money is spent, how much, and on what is, uh, are of course, key questions. So again, imagine that we're still sort of back in 1989, but we're allowing ourselves to advance in, towards our present a little bit. Stay to the left, don't stand in front of the slides. Meta comment. Imagine that, and so we're going to uh, do our very best to determine the level of risk in an application. This, uh, this chart here is about one database application. And uh, bear with me, I'm not going to take you all the way through it. I couldn't take you all the way through it. But if you, can see the, if you can see the text, and we're in the first few lines, the probability that it's going to be breached is partly based on the probability that it has already been breached. And if you keep reading, you're going to talk about subsequent probabilities of breaches. You're also going to be talking about parametric distributions. And imagine doing this for each and every application that matters to you in an enterprise with hundreds or thousands. And they're not all yours. You depend on other people's too. Imagine this poor chief security officer, this poor member of the risk committee, trying to bring some level of diligence to the process, but facing, facing things like this. This came from a, uh, uh, a small college business school. Uh, in the worst case scenario, this isn't, this isn't Richard Feynman, but I think of this as a Feynman-esque type of blackboard picture, the, uh, the famous physicist. There's some issues here. There's probability, trying to factor that in as part of probability. And it says in these three checkmark bullets, if you get this wrong and you've assessed risk improperly, um, you might be wasting time and money dealing with the risk of losses that weren't really going to happen anyway. That's one way it could go wrong. Another way it could go wrong is you could spend too much money and time, and those things are certainly related, assessing and managing unlikely risks uh, that you could be using those resources to do something else that was more profitable. And finally, unlikely events occur, um, but if, it's, if the risk is unlikely enough to occur, you might as well just not worry about it at all and just deal with the result. So the probability priming in your head should have kicked off there, but the national security and also strategic risk elements to a company should also be firing a little bit because just deal with the result is not an option when the result is complete catastrophe. Remember, I'm, I'm not an alarmist. This is just a thought experiment. I might be using terms that sound a little extreme. 
but in some cases we are talking about that. If you were paying attention to Jason's, Jason Larson's conversation, we are talking about potentially catastrophic, unrecoverable result, results, even when the sanguine language here makes it sound like, don't worry about it, if it's unlikely, we'll just clean up afterwards. Keep coming back to risk, I mean, excuse me, to NIST, because this sort of is the one language that we all speak, and the plethora of special uh, publications uh, and different regulations that they publish. Something about their language, however, strikes me as far too squishy. It doesn't give me something solid to hold on to when I'm trying to show real work. If you look at a couple of these things, I won't read them all out loud, for example, but it basically says, and I'll skim, organizations can take a variety of approaches in determining likelihood. Just, there's a smorgasbord out there, choose something, okay? Um, some people want to talk about risk in terms of the likelihood an event's going to happen. Other people will also want to bundle in the uh, likelihood of the adverse effects happening as part of that, that breach or that incident. And some people keep them separate, some bundle them. Uh, the third thing, you can choose a method that's, that goes and fits well with your organizational culture and your risk tolerance, you know, from reading the posters in the, the big meeting room. And then lastly, you can feed in empirical data and statistics and make it look real sciencey, so that when you show people your work, you can um, boggle them to a little bit the way I showed you in that, that earlier Richard Feynman type slide. Again, for me, that NIST, NIST guidance is far too squishy and intangible. Uh, makes me nervous when we're talking about really important things. So here's Ralph again, the somewhat sober German person who spoke to you earlier. Um, in his opening of, of his book, which was published uh, shortly after Stuxnet, um, Robust Control Networks is the title, I believe, he talks about cyber and risk and likelihood to a certain extent, and then realizing, or he knew in advance, that his audience that he's trying to reach is primarily engineers and operators, he brushes it off to the side and says, you know what, we're not even gonna use those terms at all. Risk and security are hypothetical, loosey-goosey terms. I'm gonna talk about robustness and fragility, sort of twin ends of a range of spectrum. We're gonna talk about whether the things contribute or detract from, from, from the, the robustness there. And secondly, in the second quote here, uh, is something where I'm not sure chicken and egg who was, who was thinking these thoughts first, but to me this, uh, this echoes Richard Danzig, former Secretary of the Navy, who wrote a paper called Surviving on a Diet of Poison Fruit, which then informed the case for simplicity in energy infrastructure and ultimately things like CCE. The basic message again from Ralph was, these things are so complicated, they're full of so much software, uh, we don't know how it interacts, we can't use formal methods beyond 25,000 or 50,000 lines. It's a complete black box. How can, we, how can we have confidence securing these things when we can't understand them? Which is a whole different issue of we don't even know what we have because we didn't do complete asset inventory yet. So here's the second faux uh, military member in this presentation. I think it's the last one. Uh, you may recognize this guy, thin, thin, thin lead line, no, thin red line. Nope. What is it again? A few good men, thank you. Thank you. There's something about his face that's making me think red. I think it, it distracted me. Nicholson. All right, so I'm saying to you, it's not that you can't handle the truth, it's just that it's, it's really hard to get at it, and you, to even know whether you did get at it if you found it. Uh, saying it is unknowable with enough accuracy or precision to be helpful, and then even if you were able to, use uh, whatever empirical data that you had and whether al algorithms were appropriate. And for one brief shining moment, there's a little bit of Heisenberg here, you were able to fully capture the actual likelihood of something going wrong in the cyber risk category. The minute you'd gone through all that work and had captured it, the world has spun around, the threat profile has changed, your own people and configurations have changed, and you don't really have it anymore. It didn't last, it was too ephemeral. Uh, most presentations, I try to inject a little bit of uh, SpongeBob. Uh, sometimes it feels like a force. I apologize if it seems that way to you. Uh, this is a uh, pie-eyed Patrick. He's all satisfied that he has captured likelihood to his satisfaction. He doesn't have a lot going on up here. Uh, what I'm saying here is that uh, what, what we think we're seeking when we go after likelihood as part of, of risk management is, is not really obtainable. And if Patrick doesn't get you, General Hayden might. Um, they're going to get in, get over it. Uh, again, as Jason said, getting in is just part of it. 
but it, it's an assured part of it. So it's something to be aware of if you have anybody in your own organization or one you're consulting to saying, don't worry, we're all set. We have firewalls, they're on the outside, everything good is on the inside. Okay. All right, a brief pause here for a sidebar. Just to refresh yourself for a moment. And I'm gonna take you to the Idaho National Lab and a way that uh, some of our folks have construed likelihood uh, probability uh, in a way that's a little bit different, and then we'll get right back on track and come down the home stretch. So you can see that instead of probability or likelihood in this risk equation, you still have impact, uh, but now we have three factors that are coming in. And Idaho's, I don't know if you have much interaction with uh, my colleagues, but it's very much an adversarial-minded place. A lot of the folks and the analysts who work there come from that profession, and so they can't help but think that way, and we can't help but think that that's a pretty good way of, of doing defense, is to know offense uh, very, very well. So we factor in capability, what we know about the adversary and the APTs, uh, their intent, this could relate to a lot of geopolitical things going on in the world, and opportunity, the whole constellation of vulnerabilities, process, technology, people, things that are happening. And so that's where uh, INL starts its process. It runs some of those concepts through kill chains, uh, kill chain-like, like steps. So here you have the who's, where's, and how's of how you'd move from targeting to access steps to the payload, which is what you really need if you're gonna create the very negative effect, very negative consequence that you're aiming for as a cyber bad guy. We also group people into different levels of capability and complexity from on the left-hand side, just the very beginners whose aspirations are, are low and capabilities are low to the uh, extremely advanced on the right-hand side. We'll zoom in on the, on the two categories that we care about the most. If you look at some of the capabilities we ascribe to the people in the advanced attack button uh, bucket, you can see that they have plenty of money. Uh, they have not just a cyber person, but they, they have the right types of engineers and subject matter experts and safety systems experts uh, to be able to form a really great cross-functional team and understand through reconnaissance and surveillance enough about your systems and your networks and the way you work, and the way your processes are designed to create very bad effects. Uh, they have very sophisticated and very tradecraft. One next to the penultimate bullet there, that persistent undetected presence is likely. So for everybody that's thinking, well, we'll do active defense, we'll keep an eye on everything, and as soon as we detect them, then we'll, we'll throw them out. Some of these people are very good at not being detected. And uh, they'll take, they'll use redundancy. Multiple systems will be approached to uh, reach the ultimate goal in case one path or several paths don't work. This slide is Dill Peterson informed. He's critiqued the way I've said this a couple times. I think we've got it down to something that can survive, and that is um, you should be you should prepare to be compromised. And uh, without saying, uh, oh, well, why would they target us? And asking those questions, you don't get to make that, that decision. So be prepared to be compromised. Uh, know that the government isn't gonna come to save you. Know that your insurance isn't gonna pay off. Uh, and so if you'll accept those two things, or those three things, what do you wanna do? We posit there are some things that you can do to put yourself in a, in a much better place. Unacceptable consequences. At this moment, please switch from uh, profitability and uh, money and into engineering, process, and safety, as I show you a couple images here. So back to the complexity issue. We can't engineer out all the risk in really, really complex systems, and occasionally we get reminders of that. These are the two space shuttle accidents. Uh, after the fact, after we did the uh, the analysis, we figured out what went wrong, but we tried to control, control for that. We couldn't control for human error all the times, which arguably played a role in, in both of these accidents. We also try to engineer systems to be really robust against th the worst things that we imagine nature throwing at us. And we're often right about that, but sometimes we're wrong, and Fukushima was a really good example of that. Um, this wasn't supposed to happen in, in, in our lifetimes, uh, and, yet, and yet it did from an engineering perspective. And then there's issues, there's consequences that are really bad and that didn't need to happen, but different shortcuts were taken, uh, different lapses in judgment or guidance occurred, and uh, these things happened. Some of, some of them uh, well before your lifetimes, depending on your age. This is Union Carbide, 
and thousands of people died in this uh, chemical uh, explosion and release of toxic gas. And people are still feeling the effects uh, in India. And Union Carbide uh, was basically the end of their company. Different things happened to them, but they couldn't, they couldn't survive this accident. Uh, that was avoidable, arguably. This is something much more proximate, the 737 MAX. And if, I, if you allow me to stereotype what I think you're like for even coming anywhere near this conference, you've probably read a fair amount about this. And I don't mean just because you get on airplanes a lot. I mean, you probably wonder what's happening from an engineering perspective twice. Uh, we can say that there's certainly been uh, lapses in judgment and engineering decisions made at Boeing for reasons that seem to have to do with profitability and, and money and uh, lapses in focusing on safety. Uh, and there were certainly lapses at their regulator, the FAA, and about the relationship between them. This, these consequences were certainly avoidable, and hundreds of lives were lost. And it's hard to say at this moment whether, whether and how Boeing is going to come out of this. They're reeling at this point, and they're such a big company in the United States. The impact of this issue is having uh, quite visible uh, ripples through the economy and the, uh, the numbers on GDP. And final example in this category, another unacceptable consequence that was clearly avoidable uh, is Chernobyl itself. Not that many people died, as far as I can tell, from the documentaries that uh, we've seen and read about. Um, but you could make the case that this particular industrial engineering problem uh, ended a country or ended an empire, depending on how you look at it. So the consequences can be quite high from these decisions. Now, in most cases here, I'm not talking to you about a cyber problem. Um, there are other more fundamental engineering issues, but as you know, the world in we, we live in now, they're just completely intertwined and you can't separate the two at all. Okay, so some, now some things coming down the home stretch, things that we found with our engineering hat on that can be done to mitigate some of these consequences. We're past likelihood now, now we're focusing on, since we've decided to put a, a spotlight on consequence, what can we do about that? Okay, so we're interested in the things that have the highest impact and the, therefore uh, highest probability. Uh, you see some chemical companies there. This is, this is what I'm asking you to, to, to imagine if it's true. Calculating probability, probability now is if your critical infrastructure, the probability of you being targeted uh, by a very serious attacker or adversary is one. And if that attacker or adversary is going after you, the probability of them going after the things that matter to you most, the things that could cause you the most damage and destruction, is also one. And if that attacker achieving the persist persistent access is required and enable to loiter and do the surveillance reconnaissance and learn enough about you, including the comparatively simple open source intel gathering uh, Jason described, that's one also. And if all those things are one, you multiply by one, you get the same thing, you get impact, risk equals impact. Again, in critical infrastructure, primarily in this case in industrial control systems for asset owners who care about them. So if that's the case we have from a national security perspective, we care about the high consequences, impacts and attacks, uh, whether they're likely to happen or not likely to happen. We've got to assume access. We're talking about sabotage and intentional misoperation once somebody gains control of the level of access authorization that the most senior, senior people have. And it's thinking about the adversarial mindset. What would they do? What would you do if you had the complete keys to the kingdom and all the knowledge you needed to drive a plant or a business to destruction? What would you do? How would you do it? Maybe we can get out in front of it. Here are some things, engineering oriented. You see uh, Ralph and Tim, both people we've mentioned in this talk already, uh, have come up with non-digital, non-software-based fail-safes and backstops uh, to be able to stop a machine, a very important machine, or dozens of the same make and model machine, uh, because you figure it out once and you get a one-to-many horizontal effect, uh, designed so that w if and when it's given a digital command to kill itself, uh, the, in this case, the Aurora attack service disruptor that they're holding there, or engine regulator over there, or even the purely physical mechanical train backstop there from Germany, the, all those things will save, save your bacon on that day. You can live to fight another day and figure out what the heck happened. Roxy at the bottom says, physics is the one thing that will never fail you. And that's true as long as you know enough about physics as much as Tim, uh, or as much as Ralph, or as much as Jason. Physics could definitely be used against you if you don't 
have enough knowledge if you don't have enough expertise or your people don't. A couple other examples I saw from Jason's earlier, and these come from uh, the two founders of the uh, process hazards company called Connexus. All of these things, whether it's the rupture disc that ruptures, the pressure relief valve that opens up and relieves the pressure, or the overlaid, overload relay that, uh, that breaks, that trips, uh, in all of these cases, it's a bad day for the people at the plant or for the operators. Their process, which costs a lot of money, is interrupted and somebody wants to know what the heck happened. The good news is that that long lead time to replace piece of equipment or dozens or hundreds or thousands of those things are still okay. You just have to figure out what happened so you can stand them up again with confidence and get things back up and running. I said this presentation is not about CCE and it certainly isn't. Uh, but this is what it looks like on one slide. When you come back to it, it's four phases. And it's mainly about the first, the first slide, or sorry, the first phase. And so there it is blown up. First thing we try to do is figure out by developing scenarios with the entity, it's very much a, a, a give and take and collaborative effort. What are, what are the worst things that could happen to you that would take you out, that would take your company out? If you're a military organization, what is your primary mission? How can I defeat that mission and basically make you irrelevant in a military context? Some ways those things map together okay between business and, and the military. So you can see that in the course of experimenting and building CCE out, come up with some different categories. Some of them we come up with, some of them the end user entity comes up with. And then we can have discussions back and forth about the, rel the relative weighting or the importance of them. Is the cost of recovery the big thing? Is the public sector impact the big thing? What about duration, breadth? Will we have integrity when it's all over or will that be lost and that'll kill us? So all those things go in and each, each, and each are considered and others may be considered in each CCE engagement. Okay, thanks for bearing with me up until this point. A couple closing statements. And there's still time for a question or two or a critique or two if you want. Again, so much depends on your perspective and thinking about whether likelihood and probability are important considerations in your risk management and in other people's risk management processes that you care about. If you're coming at it from a nation point of view, uh, you have to think about de 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 protecting critical infrastructure, the things that are the most important uh, from a military point of view, from an economic point of view, from a health and safety point of view for, for your citizens. And in a sense, from a risk management, you have to think about the highest consequences independent of the probabilities. Because as I said, money sometimes can be uh, knocked down a notch or two in these considerations. If you're an asset owner, on the other hand, things, things change a little bit. And uh, your responsibility self for self-defense includes both identifying and then defending the things that are the most important, the most important uh, systems that, that protect your most or that help operate the most essential functions, okay? So your risk management approach is a lot about prioritizing defense of the things that can't fail, using some of the methods perhaps that we described in the previous slides, but then allowing traditional risk management with all the calculations that you want to add when you're talking about the entire enterprise, right? Everybody has, has all IT and all business functions in addition to the OT and stuff we talk about in this conference. So that's all fair game and money plays a bigger role when you get to the uh, entire enterprise. So critical infrastructure, mission matters the most, use whatever uh, methodology you think is the most appropriate for your company. But once you've identified the most essential stuff, make sure they need to be defended differently. Probability is not such a big factor there. If in the end you absolutely insist on determining probability, this is one sh you know, time proven way to go. I looked it up for you in advance. Prices may shift uh, depending on their calculus, but for relatively low money, you can do it the old fashioned way. Uh, and it has the benefit of being completely analog. Now there could be a supply chain problem. They could have intercepted, but should be okay. This or Palantir, et cetera. This is, the, other than the, the thank you slide, this is the last slide. This is a colleague of Sarah Freeman. Kurt, his name's Curtis St. Michael and Mike Asante, who I mentioned earlier. These three people plus a handful of others are really the, the godfathers and godmothers of CCE, which this presentation is not about. And it says basically, we were speaking to people who, uh, whose minds were fully overwhelmed by the challenge ahead of them. And Curtis said, Curtis said to them, trying to calm them down a little bit, uh, when you bring your engineering mindset to these problems, uh, 
it is not a, it is not an act of God. It's not mystical like the crystal ball would have you suggest would suggest. You can control these things. You can definitely demonstrably reduce your consequences if you decide to do that and not just be lost in a lot of uh, hope that your hygiene is going to pay off. So there's Curtis with a final word. And then other final words here. These come from Dan Gear. He puts these at the end of his keynotes. Thanks for your time. I really appreciated talking with you. There's a couple minutes for questions if you want. You shared a lot of your thoughts on um, determining the risk, to uh, the risk tolerance. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts in terms of reliability? And we hear a lot about resiliency. How are we approaching things perhaps differently when we look at the cyber and OT with the word resiliency, what sure. does that mean when you look at that equation? Sure, I, thank I, you. I, th I, think I, I think I can answer this. I'm always worried I can't answer it. Um, in terms of uh, OT systems, I think when we, when we showed you some of those mechanical fail-safes, valves that open up, relays th th that'll open, or a disc that will break to relieve the pressure, uh, we're showing you something where the machine itself, the ICS system that then controls the machine, um, will be okay. It, it'll be a problem because it'll be a disruption. As the CEO of one of the first utilities we did this methodology to said, um, and this is a big Florida CEO uh, utility, I can handle disruption. This is to your resilience point. I can handle disruption. What I can't handle is destruction of long lead time to replace equipment. Then I'm dead. I have no options. But if it knocks me down for a while, we're used to that from hurricanes and depending on what country, part of the country you're in or what country you're in, you're used to different types of periodic disruptions. So I think that's, that's mainly it. Another thing, if you don't mind, is um, uh, I cited uh, Dan Gear as the source of these, these uh, nice closing comments. Uh, in his uh, paper called A Rubicon, which was a few years ago, it's only about 15 pages long, highly recommended. It has a lot of discussions about AI in it. He has a very simple statement that I use sometimes, which is the wellspring of risk is dependency. To the extent you're dependent on something, uh, that it, therein lies your risk. If you could have a plan B to your question, that it, when, if and when something goes wrong and someone owns this uh, OT uh, system or process or network, you've thought about it and you've made a backup plan, even though you'll hear some people say, and I think they're right, in some parts of the economy, we, we are full all in on automation and we don't have a choice. I still don't like to accept that. I still want to think of uh, how do we survive? How do we fight through, operate through an attack that's having some success with this? And if it's not nation state level, like I'm describing largely in this presentation to you, think about ransomware and all the folks that find that they don't have access to the data that they needed or the applications that they counted on. And now they're using paper and pencil and I'm sure spreadsheets to try to piece their world back together again, stay alive long enough, provide a government service to their town or to the hospital or to the K through 12 or university school. They're being forced to do it uh, re reactively. It would behoove us to all imagine those things happening and get out in front of them. So we have a plan B we could have some confidence in. Meanwhile, keeping operating plan A is uh, to the best way we can. Sure. All right, we probably have time for one more quick question. Okay, if not, please join me in thanking Mr. Andy Bachman. Thank you, guys.